Hi, my sweet friends, and welcome back to Crochet Every Day with Judy. We are reading again from the Adventures of Pinocchio, starting with chapter 16. The beautiful child with blue hair has the puppet taken down, has him put to bed, and calls in three doctors. Whilst poor Pinocchio, suspended to a branch of the big oak, was apparently more dead than alive, the beautiful child with blue hair came again to the window. When she saw the unhappy puppet hanging by his throat, <coughs> excuse me, and dancing up and down in the gusts of the north wind, she was moved by compassion. Striking her hands together, she made three little claps. At this signal, there came a sound of the sweep of wings flying rapidly, and a large falcon flew on to the windowsill. What are your orders, gracious fairy? he asked, inclining his beak in sign of reverence. For I must tell you that the child with blue hair was no more and no less than a beautiful fairy who for more than a thousand years had lived in the wood. Do you see that puppet dangling from a branch of the big oak? Of the big oak? I see him. Very well. Fly there at once with your strong beak. Break the knot that keeps him suspended in the air and lay him gently on the grass at the foot of the tree. The falcon flew away and after two minutes he returned saying, I have done as you commanded. And how did you find him? To see him, he appeared dead, but he cannot really be quite dead, for I had no sooner loosened the running noose that tightened his throat than, giving a sigh, he muttered in a faint voice, Now I feel better. The fairy, then striking her hands together, made two little claps, and a magnificent poodle appeared walking upright on his hind legs, exactly as if he had been a man. He was in the full dress livery of a coachman. On his head, he had a three-cornered cap braided with gold. His curly white wig came down to his shoulders. He had a chocolate-colored waistcoat with diamond buttons and two large pockets to contain the bones that his mistress gave him at dinner. He had, besides, a pair of short crimson velvet breeches, silk stockings, cut-down shoes, and hanging behind him a species of umbrella case made of blue satin to put his tail into when the weather was rainy. "'Be quick, Medoro, like a good dog,' said the fairy to the poodle. "'Have the most beautiful carriage in my coach house put to "'and take the road to the wood. "'When you come to the big oak, "'you will find a poor puppet stretched on the grass half dead. "'Pick him up gently and lay him flat on the cushions of the carriage "'and bring him here to me. "'Have you understood?' "'The poodle, to show that he had understood, "'shook the case of blue satin that he had on three or four times "'and ran off like a racehorse. "'Shortly afterwards, a beautiful little carriage came out of the coach house.' The cushions were stuffed with canary feathers, and it was lined in the inside with whipped cream, custard, and Savoy biscuits. The little carriage was drawn by a hundred pairs of white mice, and the poodle, seated on the coach box, cracked his whip from side to side like a driver when he is afraid that he is behind time. A quarter of an hour had not passed when the carriage returned. The fairy, who was waiting at the door of the house, took the poor puppet in her arms and carried him into a little room that was wainscoted with mother of pearl and sent at once to summon the most famous doctors in the neighborhood. The doctors came immediately one after the other, namely a crow, an owl, and a talking cricket. I wish to know from you gentlemen, said the fairy, turning the, to the three doctors who were assembled round Pinocchio's bed. I wish to know from you gentlemen if this unfortunate puppet is alive or dead. At this request, the crow, advancing first, felt Pinocchio's pulse. He then felt his nose, and then the little toe of his foot, and having done this carefully, he pronounced solemnly the following words. To my belief, the puppet is already quite dead, but if unfortunately he should not be dead, then it would be a sign that he is still alive. I regret, said the owl, to be obliged to contradict the crow, my illustrious friend and colleague, but in my opinion the puppet is still alive, but if unfortunately he should not be alive, then it would be a sign that he is dead indeed. And you, have you nothing to say? asked the fairy of the talking cricket. In my opinion, the wisest thing a prudent doctor can do when he does not know what he is talking about is to be silent. For the rest, that puppet there has a face that is not new to me. I have known him for some time. Pinocchio, who up to that moment had lain immovable like a real piece of wood, was seized with a fit of convulsive trembling that shook the whole bed. That puppet there, continued the talking cricket, is a confirmed rogue. Pinocchio opened his eyes, but then shut them again immediately. He is a ragamuffin, a do-nothing, a vagabond. Pinocchio hid his face beneath the clothes. That puppet there is a disobedient son who will make his poor father die of a broken heart. At that instant, a suffocated sound of sobs and crying was heard in the room. Imagine everybody's astonishment when, having raised the sheets a little, it was discovered that the sounds came from Pinocchio. 
When the dead person cries, it is a sign that he is on the road to get well, said the crow solemnly. I grieve to contradict my illustrious friend and colleague, added the owl, but for me, when the dead person cries, it is a sign that he is sorry to die. Chapter 17. Pinocchio eats the sugar, but will not take his medicine. When, however, he sees the grave diggers, he takes it. He then tells a lie, and his nose grows longer. As soon as the three doctors had left the room, the fairy approached Pinocchio, and having touched his forehead, she perceived that he was in a high fever that was not to be trifled with. She therefore dissolved a certain white powder in half a tumbler of water, and offering it to the puppet, she said to him lovingly, Drink it, and in a few days you will be cured. Pinocchio looked at the tumbler, made a wry face, and then asked in a plaintive voice, Is it sweet or bitter? It is bitter, but it will do you good. If it is bitter, I will not take it. Listen to me, drink it. I don't like anything bitter. Drink it, and when you have drunk it, I will give you a lump of sugar to take away the taste. Where is the lump of sugar? Here it is, said the fairy, taking a piece from a gold sugar basin. Give me first the lump of sugar, and then I will drink that bad, bitter water. Do you promise me? Yes. The fairy gave him the sugar, and Pinocchio, having crunched it up and swallowed it in a second, said, lick licking his lips, It would be a fine thing if sugar was medicine. I would take it every day. Now keep your promise and drink these few drops of water, which will restore you to health. Pinocchio took the tumbler unwillingly in his hand and put the point of his nose to it. He then approached it to his lips. He then again put his nose to it, and at last said, it is too bitter, too bitter. I cannot drink it. How can you tell that when you have not even tasted it? I can imagine it. I know it from the smell. I want first another lump of sugar, and then I will drink it. The fairy then, with all the patience of a good mamma, put another lump of sugar in his mouth, and then again presented the tumbler to him. I cannot drink it so, said the puppet, making a thousand grimaces. Why? Because that pillow that is down there on my feet bothers me. The fairy removed the pillow. It is useless. Even so, I cannot drink it. What is the matter now? The door of the room, which is half open, bothers me. The fairy went and closed the door. In short, cried Pinocchio, bursting into tears, I will not drink that bitter water. No, no, no. My boy, you will repent it. I don't care. Your illness is serious. I don't care. The fever in a few hours will carry you into the other world. I don't care. Are you not afraid of death? I am not in the least afraid. I would rather die than drink that bitter medicine. At that moment, the door of the room flew open and four rabbits as black as ink entered carrying on their shoulders a little buyer. What do you want with me? cried Pinocchio, sitting up in a bed in a great fright. We are come to take you, said the biggest rabbit. To take me? But I am not yet dead. No, not yet, but you have only a few minutes to live as you have refused the medicine that would have cured you of the fever. Oh, fairy, fairy, the puppet then began to scream. Give me the tumbler at once. Be quick, for pity's sake, for I will not die. No, I will not die. And taking the tumbler in both hands, he emptied it at a draft. We must have patience, said the rabbit. This time we have made our journey in vain. And taking the little buyer again on their shoulders, they left the room grumbling and murmuring between their teeth. In fact, a few minutes afterwards, Pinocchio jumped down from the bed quite well, because you must know that wooden puppets have the privilege of being seldom ill and of being cured very quickly. The fairy, seeing him running and rushing about the room as gay and lively as a young cock, said to him, Then my medicine has really done you good? Good? I should think so. It has restored me to life. Then why on earth did you require so much persuasion to take it? Because you see that we boys are all like that. We are more afraid of medicine than of the illness. Disgraceful. Boys ought to know that a good remedy taken in time may save them from a serious illness and perhaps even from death. But another time I shall not require so much persuasion. I shall remember those black rabbits with the buyer on their shoulders, and then I shall immediately take the tumbler in my hand, and down it will go. Now come here to me and tell me how it came about that you fell into the hands of those assassins. It came about that the showman fire eater gave me some gold pieces and said to me, Go and take them to your father, and instead I met on the road a fox and a cat, two very respectable persons who said to me, would you like these those pieces of gold to become a thousand or two? Come with us and we will take you to the field of miracles. And I said, let us go. And they said, let us stop at the end of the red crawfish. And after midnight, they left. And when I awoke, I found that they were no longer there because they had gone away. Then I began to travel by night, for you cannot imagine how dark it was. And on that account, I met on the road two assassins in charcoal sacks who said to me, out with your money. And I said to them, I have got none. 
because I had hidden the four gold pieces in my mouth, and one of the assassins tried to put his hand in my mouth, and I bit his hand off and spat it out, but instead of a hat, hand, I spat out a cat's paw. And the assassins ran after me, and I ran and ran until at last they caught me and tied me by the neck to a tree in this wood and then said to me, Tomorrow we shall return here, and then you will be dead with your mouth open, and we shall be able to carry off the pieces of gold that you have hidden under your tongue. And the four pieces, where have you put them? asked the fairy. I have lost them, said Pinocchio, but he was telling a lie, for he had them in his pocket. He had scarcely told the lie when his nose, which was already long, grew at once two fingers longer. And where did you lose them? In the wood near here. At this second lie, his nose went on growing. If you have lost them in the wood near here, said the fairy, we will look for them and we shall find them, because everything that is lost in that wood is always found. Ah, now I remember all about it, replied the puppet, getting quite confused. I didn't lose the four gold pieces. I swallowed them inadvertently while I was drinking your medicine. At this third lie, his nose grew to such an extraordinary length that poor Pinocchio could not move in any direction. If he turned to one side, he struck his nose against the bed or the window panes. If he turned to the other, he struck it against the walls or the door. If he raised his head a little, he ran the risk of sticking it into one of the fairy's eyes. And the fairy looked at him and laughed. What are you laughing at? asked the puppet, very confused and anxious at finding his nose growing so prodigiously. I am laughing at the lie you have told. And how can you possibly know that I have told a lie? Lies, my dear boy, are found out immediately because they are of two sorts. There are lies that have short legs and lies that have long noses. Your lie, as it happens, is one of those that have a long nose. Pinocchio, not knowing where to hide himself for shame, tried to run out of the room. But he did not succeed, for his nose had increased so much that it could no longer pass through the door. Chapter 18. Pinocchio meets again the fox and the cat and goes with them to bury his money in the field of miracles. The fairy, as you can imagine, allowed the puppet to cry and to roar for a good half hour over his nose, which could no longer pass through the door of the room. This she did to give him a severe lesson and to correct him of the disgraceful fault of telling lies, the most disgraceful fault, disgraceful fault that the boy can have. But when she saw him quite disfigured and his eyes swollen out of his head from weeping, she felt full of compassion for him. She therefore beat her hands together, and at that signal, a thousand large birds called woodpeckers flew in at the window. They immediately perched on Pinocchio's nose and began to peck at it with such zeal that in a few minutes his enormous and ridiculous nose was reduced to its usual dimensions. What a good fairy you are, said the puppet, drying his eyes, and how much I love you. I love you also, answered the fairy, and if you will remain with me, you shall be my little brother, and I will be your good little sister. I would remain willingly, but my poor papa. I have thought of everything. I have already let your father know, and he will be here tonight. Really, shouted Pinocchio, jumping, jumping for joy. Then, little fairy, if you consent, I should like to go and meet him. I am so anxious to give a kiss to that poor old man who has suffered so much on my account that I am counting the minutes. Go then, but be careful not to lose yourself. Take the road through the wood, and I am sure that you will meet him. Pinocchio set out, and as soon as he was in the wood, he began to run like a kid. But when he had reached a certain spot, almost in front of the big oak, he stopped because he thought that he heard people amongst the bushes. In fact, two persons came out into the road. Can you guess who they were? His two traveling companions, the fox and the cat, with whom he had supped at the inn of the red crawfish. Why, here is our dear Pinocchio, cried the fox, kissing and embracing him. How come you to be here? How come you to be here, repeated the cat. It is a long story, answered the puppet, which I will tell you when I have time. But do you know that the other night when you left me alone at the inn, I met with assassins on the road? Assassins? Oh, poor Pinocchio, and what did they want? They wanted to rob me of my gold pieces. Villains, said the fox. Infamous villains, repeated the cat. But I ran away from them. Sorry about that. But I ran, I ran away from them, continued the puppet, and they followed me. And at last they overtook me and hung me to a branch of that oak tree. And Pinocchio pointed to the big oak, which is two steps from them. Is it possible to hear of anything more dreadful, said the fox, in what a world we are condemned to live? Where can respectable people like us find a safe refuge? Whilst they were thus talking, Pinocchio observed that the cat was lame of her front right leg, for in fact she had lost her paw with all its claws. He therefore asked her, 
What have you done with your paw? The cat tried to answer but became confused. Therefore, the fox said immediately, My friend is too modest, and that is why she doesn't speak. I will answer for her. I must tell you that an hour ago we met an old wolf on the road, almost fainting from want of food, who asked alms of us. Not having so much as a fishbone to give him, what did my friend, who is really the heart of a Caesar, do? She bit off one of her forepaws and threw it to that poor beast that he might appease his hunger. And the fox, in relating this, dried a tear. Pinocchio was also touched, and approaching the cat, he whispered into her, her ear, If all cats resembled you, how fortunate the mice would be! And now, what are you doing here? asked the fox of the puppet. I am waiting for my papa, who I'm, who I'm, whom I expect to arrive every moment. And your gold pieces? I have got them in my pocket, all but one that I spent at the inn of the red crawfish. And to think that instead of four pieces, by tomorrow they might become one or two thousand. Why do you not listen to my advice? Why will you not go and bury them in the field of miracles? Today it is impossible. I will go another day. Another day will be too late, said the fox. Why? Because the field has been bought by a gentleman, and after tomorrow, no one will be allowed to bury money there. How far off is the field of miracles? Not two miles. Will you come with us? In half an hour, you will be there. You can bury your money at once, and in a few minutes, you will collect 2,000, and this evening, you will return with your pockets full. Will you come with us? Pinocchio thought of the good fairy, old Geppetto, and the warnings of the talking cricket, and he hesitated a little before answering. He ended, however, by doing as all boys do who have not a grain of sense and who have no heart. He ended by giving his head a little shake and saying to the fox and the cat, Let us go, I will come with you. And they went. After having walked half the day, they reached a town that was called Trap for Blockheads. As soon as Pinocchio entered this town, he saw that the streets were crowded with dogs who had lost their coats and who were yawning from hunger, shorn sheep trembling with cold, cocks without combs or crests who were begging for a grain of Indian corn, large butterflies who could no longer fly because they had sold their beautiful colored wings, peacocks who had no tails and were ashamed to be seen, and pheasants who went scratching about in a subdued fashion, mourning for their brilliant gold and silver feathers gone forever. In the midst of this crowd of beggars and shamefaced creatures, some lordly carriage passed from time to time, containing a fox or a thieving magpie or some other ravenous bird of prey. And where is the field of miracles? asked Pinocchio. It is here, not two steps from us. They crossed the town and having gone beyond the walls, they came to a solitary field, which to look at resembled all other fields. We are arrived, said the fox to the puppet. Now stoop down and dig with your hands a little hole in the ground and put your gold pieces into it. Pinocchio obeyed. He dug a hole, put into it the four gold pieces that he had left, and then filled up the hole with a little earth. Now then, said the fox, go to that canal close to us. Fetch a can of water and water the ground where you have sowed them. Pinocchio went to the canal, and as he had no can, he took off one of his old shoes, and filling it with water, he watered the ground over the hole. He then asked, is there anything else to be done? Nothing else, answered the fox. We can now go away. You can return in about 20 minutes and you will find a shrub already pushing through the ground with its branches quite loaded with money. The poor puppet beside himself with joy thanked the fox and the cat a thousand times and promised them a beautiful present. We wish for no presents, answered the ra two rascals. It is enough for us to have taught you the way to enrich yourself without undergoing hard work and we are as happy as folk out for a holiday. Thus saying, they took leave of Pinocchio, and wishing him a good harvest, went about their business. Chapter 19. Pinocchio is robbed of his money, and as a punishment, he is sent to prison for four months. The puppet returned to the town and began to count the minutes one by one, and when he thought that it must be time, he took the road leading to the Field of Miracles. And as he walked along with hurried steps, his heart beat fast, tick-tack, tick-tack, like a drawing-room clock, when it is really going well. Meanwhile, he was thinking to himself, and if instead of a thousand gold pieces, I was to find on the branches of the tree 2,000, and instead of 2,000, supposing I found 5,000, and instead of 5,000, that I found a 100,000, oh, what a fine gentleman I should then become. I would have a beautiful palace, a thousand little wooden horses, and a thousand stables to amuse myself with, a cellar full of currant wine and sweet syrups, and a library quite full of candies, tarts, plum cakes, macaroons, and biscuits with cream. 
Whilst he was building these castles in the air, he had arrived in the neighborhood of the field, and he stopped to look if by chance he could perceive a tree with its branches laden with money. But he saw nothing. He advanced another hundred steps. Nothing. He entered the field. He went right up to the little hole where he had built, buried his sovereigns, and nothing. He then became very thoughtful, and forgetting the rule of society and good manners, he took his hands out of his pockets and gave his head a long scratch. At that moment, he heard an explosion of laughter close to him, and looked up. He, looking up, he saw a large parrot perched on a tree who was pruning the few feathers he had left. "'Why are you laughing?' asked Pinocchio in an angry voice. "'I am laughing because in pruning my feathers I tickled myself under my wings.' The puppet did not answer, but went to the canal, and filling the same old shoe full of water, he proceeded to water the earth afresh that covered his gold pieces. <clears throat> Whilst he was thus occupied, another laugh, and still more impertinent than the first, rang out in the silence of that solitary place. Once for all, shouted Pinocchio in a rage, may I know, you ill-educated parrot, what you are laughing at? I am laughing at those simpletons who believe in all the foolish things that are told them, and who allow themselves to be entrapped by those who are more cunning than they are. Are you perhaps speaking of me? Yes, I am speaking of you, poor Pinocchio. Of you who are simple enough to believe that money can be sown and gathered in fields in the same way as beans and gourds. I also believed it once, and today I am suffering for it. Today, but it is too late. I have at last learnt that to put a few pennies honestly together, it is necessary to know how to earn them, either by the work of our own hands or by the cleverness of our own brains. I don't understand you, said the puppet, who was already trembling with fear. Have patience. I will explain myself better, rejoined the parrot. You must know, then, that whilst you were in the town, the fox and the cat returned to the field. They took the buried money and then fled like the wind, and now he that catches them will be clever. Pinocchio remained with his mouth open, and not choosing to believe the parrot's words, he, be he began with his hands and nails to dig up the earth that he had watered. And he dug and dug and dug and made such a deep hole that a rick of straw might have stood upright in it, but the money was no longer there. He rushed back to the town in a state of desperation and went at once to the courts of justice to denounce the two knaves who had robbed him to the judge. The judge was a big ape of the gorilla tribe, an old ape, respectable for his age, his white, be his white beard, but especially for his gold spectacles without glasses that he was always obliged to wear on account of an inflammation of the eyes that had tormented him for many years. Pinocchio related in the presence of the judge all the particulars of the infamous fraud of which he had been the victim. He gave the names, the surnames, and other details of the two rascals, and ended by demanding justice. The judge listened with great benignity, took a lively interest in the story, was much touched and moved, and when the puppet had nothing further to say, he stretched out his hand and rang a bell. At this summons, two mastiffs immediately appeared dressed as gendarmes. The judge then, pointing to Pinocchio, said to them, that poor devil has been robbed of four gold pieces. Take him up and put him immediately into prison. The puppet was petrified on hearing this unexpected sentence and tried to protest, but the gendarmes, to avoid losing time, stopped his mouth and carried him off to the lockup. And there he remained for four months, four long months, and he would have remained longer still if a fortunate chance had not released him. For I must tell you that the young emperor who reigned over the, ta the town of Trap the Blockheads, having won a splendid victory over his enemies, ordered great public rejoicings. There were illuminations, fireworks, horse races, and velocipede races, and as a further sign of triumph, he commanded that, th that the prison should be opened and all the prisoners liberated. If the others are to be let out of prison, I will go also, said Pinocchio to the jailer. No, not you, said the jailer, because you do not belong to the fortunate class. I beg your pardon, replied Pinocchio. I am also a criminal. In that case, you are perfectly right, said the jailer, and taking off his hat and bowing to him respectfully, he opened the prison doors and let him escape. We'll stop there and start next time with chapter 20. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.